Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our monthly stimuli breakfast, which is also our third and final event of the ULI Tampa Bay 21 day equitable challenge for this area. My name is Lucia Garces, and I am chair of the ULI Tampa Bay. The Urban Land Institute is the oldest and largest cross-disciplinary organization in the world. We have about 40,000 members. We have over the many decades set, our high, high, set the highest standards for our industry. We've adapted, we've grown and evolved to seek out leading practices. And as such, ULI at the global level has recently changed its mission statement to ensure that we are building an environment for the transformation of the communities that we live, work and play in. We've recently added uh, as part of our mission, the need to connect, inspire and lead. And that is the purpose of today is to connect you all, to inspire you and to lead us into a community that is more equitable as we move into next levels of development. As we continue to mature, we now face the continued challenge of diversifying our organization and our industry, cementing equity into our core and casting our net wider to expand inclusivity in our organization and in the communities that we impact. ULI's previous commitments to building healthy places, sustainable and resilient communities and addressing social equity have laid the foundation for this next very deliberate effort to ensure that diversity, equity and inclusion are ultimately not what we do, but who we are. We recently convened a racial equity task force in the fall chaired by Leroy Moore of the Tampa Housing Authority to develop a roadmap for us to identify the steps for our future efforts. I am grateful to each one who have given their time and their effort in this, in this challenge. I thank Eric Eisenberg of the University of South Florida who led us in this effort and engaged us in some very difficult conversations. And Jenna, is there another slide with the, um, with the thank you. I do want to pay tribute to all of the folks who worked with us, to Leonard Burke, to Bill Eschenbaugh, to Lee Fletcher, to Lyle Fogarty, to Rena Frazier and Taylor Ralph, who along with our staff of Siobhan and Jenna worked through a number of very difficult issues and very difficult conversations to frame the work that we're going to engage in. And so I would like to highlight at this point, the key recommendations that have come from this group that deal with education and awareness, diversity of membership and leadership, the pub pipeline to, uh, to opportunities and uh, engagement and community impact. And engagement and community impact is what we're about today in terms of sharing with our members and with the community, these opportunities of understanding race, equity, inclusiveness, and diversity in our communities. Education and awareness is our first step. And we've started with this challenge, which we hope to repeat next year. And with the input that you will provide to us, we hope to improve and expand the opportunities for understanding how racism has impacted our communities in created barriers for development that is equitable and inclusive. So today I would like to turn our program over to Ernest Hooper, who is a dear friend and Ernest will take us through some difficult conversations that deal with particularly the South St. Petersburg area. And so now I turn it over to my dear friend, Ernest Hooper, who is the Vice President of Communications at United Way Suncoast Chapter. Please, Ernest. Thank you, Lucia. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to having a terrific candid conversation. We want to encourage everyone to uh, speak honestly and truthfully. Uh, we are here to deal in unvarnished truths. 
and really strike at uh, the core of the subject matter today, which is uh, development in St. Petersburg and specifically development along the 22nd Street corridor. Development projects have long possessed the promise of elevating community, but in St. Petersburg, the potential has gone unfulfilled in a number of African American neighborhoods and districts. Now, the 22nd Street Corridor, an area south of Central Avenue in Tropicana Field, known as the Deuces, stands poised to enjoy a renaissance. The Deuces Live Main Street looks to lead a revival on the corridor while preserving its cultural heritage. The Manhattan Casino, once a thriving hub of entertainment and social life in racially segregated St. Petersburg, sits in the heart of the district. It's now seeking to reimagine itself as a food hall with heart and tangible benefits to the greater community. Across the street, the Dr. Carter G. Woodson African American Museum has unveiled its first rendition of an updated museum. Both developments are located at a unique intersection of this burgeoning growth area. <clears throat> On the parcel just north of the future home of the museum, the Sankofa project is emerging as a mixed use, mixed income development that will feature 28,000 to 32,000 square feet of retail, office, incubator, and co-work space, as well as 26 townhomes to be affordably sold to families from 60 to 120% AMI. It's being touted as one of the most innovative equity initiatives in the nation for its occupant octopus approach to economic impact in Black St. Petersburg. A little further north along the corridor is Place Project. It's looking to convert seven acres into a series of first floor light industrial uses with commercial office space and residential uses on upper floors. At the same time, it's striving to connect to the community and the area's historic culture. Clearly, 22nd Street is enjoying a moment, but what needs to happen to turn this moment into a movement? What are the mistakes of the past that must be avoided to bring true promise to these latest efforts? What can the developers with us today learn about how to create connection with communities? And what lessons can all of us glean about the responsible, about responsibly developing land that leads to a true transformative impact on communities. Joining us today to discuss these issues and uh, illuminate uh, the answer to those questions are four terrific people. Uh, first, we have Beatrice Farrell, Executive Director of Deuces Live, a certified Florida Main Street located on the historic 22nd Street South Corridor in St. Petersburg. Also joining us, Gypsy Gallardo, one of the leaders of the aforementioned Sankofa project and a longtime driving force behind a number of economic development initiatives in St. Petersburg, including one community which seeks to tear down the silos that traditionally separate developers from stewards of community development interests while building sustainable policies and platforms to foster economic equity. Also joining us on the panel today is the founder and managing principal of Place Projects, Joe First. Joe is working on the uh, aforementioned Place Project on 22nd Street, as well as projects in West Palm Beach, Doral, and Miami. Uh, Place Projects seeks to focus and emphasize the human experience while creating memorable experiences and enhancing the community. Finally on the panel is Lee Fletcher, a land use real estate and environmental attorney who owns several businesses, including the Rising Tide Innovation Center in downtown St. Petersburg. Lee is part of the investment group that's working to reimagine the historic Manhattan Casino. Welcome to our panelists. Thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, Beatrice Farrell, I wanted to start with you and uh, ask you to give us an understanding of the stops and starts surrounding 22nd Street and where that has put us today. Thank you, um, Ernest. So if we look at what has gone on 
on the 22nd Street corridor, maybe go back um, 11 years. There have been several developments that never really came to fruition. There was the first iteration of Tangerine Plaza. And just for your audience's sake, I want to make the distinction of geographically where we're located. We're on the 22nd Street South Corridor and in, in, in from the city's planning website, it shows that the Deuces Corridor as a business district is from 2nd Avenue South to 18th Avenue South. The um, Main Street, however, is just 8th Avenue South to 15th Avenue South. So that really has more to do with our, um, with, thank you, with our um, certification. So there have been several developments that didn't come to fruition. People may or may not remember um, when there was a grocery store at 18th Avenue South that was supposed to be the key of one of the keys of redevelopment. Around the same time, GTE opened a bank and um, Dollar General was a store right on the corner on 18th Avenue. There were four corridor, four corners that were all utilized at one time. Um, a, a, a new elementary school was put there. That has had starts and stops. Then we have right in the center of the Deuces Live is uh, the Manhattan Casino redeveloped approximately nine years ago. And unfortunately that didn't pan out the way that we all wanted it to. But in a dispersed through all that is development that has been successful, but because the development isn't contingent, you can't really see what people have done over the course of, well, I'm, I'm just going back 17 years because it's not concentrated. So I, I will stop there so that you'll, you have an opportunity to speak to the other people on the panel. Okay, let's turn next uh, to you, Gypsy. I was wondering if you could share with us the, the energy that remains on the deuces, the importance of connecting with the community, and what you've been working to achieve with the city uh, in terms of community benefits. Okay, thank you so much, um, Ernest. I absolutely love the uh, moment or movement um, theme for this session. Um, I think that we are at such an incredibly unique time along the deuces. And I'm going to ask if Jenna can show the rise, fall, and rebirth uh, graphic that I sent you uh, at about five o'clock this morning, burning candles on both ends. Because I want to start and kind of go into a storytelling framework to help folks understand why uh, so many majority black and majority brown communities have such large concentrations of um, underdeveloped sites, vacant properties, sometimes blighted properties, et cetera. And I wanna tell that story through uh, the lens of the deuces, which is 22nd Street in St. Petersburg. Do we have that graphic available? Okay, and this is going to be too small. We can certainly post this to the ULI website um, for folks who want to look at this in more detail. But I want you to concentrate on that uh, white line in the black space that rises and then peaks and then falls. A and there's a story here that unfolded in the city of St. Petersburg that is so similar to so many African American, historic African American communities. And if you just look on the left there, um, we won't go by this point by point, but there was a substantial real estate development boom along the deuces in the 1920s uh, through 60s. Um, you, you may have heard of the famous Elder Jordan here in St. Pete who led some of that development along the corridor that, that Beatrice um, helms the redevelopment of. And that is the era when the famous historic Manhattan Casino uh, opened along with other sites. Um, and it was the era of segregation. So you had segregated movie theaters, doctor's offices, uh, professional offices, the concentration and the force of segregation created a captive consumer market that caused um, the economy, the black economy of South St. Petersburg 
to thrive despite widespread uh, poverty in the population and, and caused a concentration of businesses. And as one of our famous authors here said it, you could live, work, date, uh, marry, uh, die and be buried all by black owned businesses and, and black led institutions in South St. Petersburg. And, and then the era of integration happened and undercut that concentration of black consumers. Shortly uh, following that, you had the uh, era of highway construction. Folks here on the call will be familiar with the urban renewal strategies that led to highway construction that led to mass displacement in communities like uh, the area surrounding the Deuces. Uh, people will be familiar with the story of Tropicana Field, which caused the displacement of nearly 300 um, physical structures. The displacement of, I believe it was 30 businesses and nine churches and 500 uh, households, including single family and multifamily combined. So there's a history of uh, economic development policy um, by federal, state, and local governments that over 50 uh, years or more um, by force of law created densities um, and economies in Black communities that were subsequently hollowed out by policies um, in the ensuing um, years. And then I want to go to the map that I gave you, Jenna. And so this is this being the history of the deuces and where we stand now is on an upswing. And if we could go to a, the uh, map that I gave you. And, and now just keep talking through it while we await that graphic. We're entering this period where there's this unprecedented concentration of uh, redevelopment projects blossoming all at once. Um, want to really acknowledge Beatrice's work in that regard, serving as an anchor, bringing parties together. Um, I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Mayor Rick Kreisman, Deputy Mayor Dr. Kanika Tomlin um, for sponsoring um, new and innovative projects like my own. Are, are, are we going to have, okay, here we go. And so all of a sudden, after the stop and start cycle that Beatrice described, the uh, opening with much fanfare of Tangerine Plaza in 2005, I was on that uh, development team. The reopening of uh, Manhattan Casino in 2013, I was also on that development team. Uh, and then the, the, the sputtering out of those enterprises and others along the deuces can I um, over the, here? over um, the space of about 12 years. I'm sorry, Beatrice. Um, I think that we can't overlook the investment of St. Petersburg College, approximately a $15 million investment in between. Those. Absolutely. When we talk about how mm -hmm. the corridor looks the way that it does, if you think of it as a snaggle tooth smile, you have job core redevelopment. You had in on one end, you had tangerine, and then you had the SBC in the middle. And again, the reason when you look at this corridor, you can't see all the investment is because it's not contiguous. And so- Exactly, exactly. And, and that's a perfect way. I love that Snagatoo description because it's not only the stop and start of the, the, the higher profile uh, projects, it's the dispersion uh, across an area that no longer enjoys the, the commercial density or the housing density that it did during its heyday. And I'm missing a couple of stars actually, which makes this, this picture even more incredible. And I wanna go to the, the photo slide of, of people um, and make a special request here on the call it, it, when I was so inspired by the moment or movement theme for this, Ernest, um, because we have put forth uh, strategies to the city, uh, and the city has been very amenable to it. Um, many of the community stakeholders are open to it, of replicating the Detroit Strategic Neighborhood uh, Initiative, beginning with the deuces in St. Petersburg leveraging the fact that the city's investment 
uh, on the books already committed is in excess of 25 million. Um, leveraging some of the private capital we're bringing to that quarter, leveraging the fact that there are an unprecedented number uh, of projects encompassing an unprecedented scale and square footage um, of development all at once within a three to five year time frame. And most importantly, in my mind, leveraging the fact that you have all of these uh, connected players operating on the juices. Um, you'll see Beatrice's picture there. You see my picture there. There will be folks there that some of your audience knows. Um, and then some that you don't. You've heard of uh, Terry Lipsy Scott's work in uh, rallying an equity strategy for the museum. Uh, Beatrice mentioned uh, SPC, St. Petersburg College. You see their president and provost here. All of these folks are now working in a con an interconnected way, um, overlapping project teams. And I wanted to seize this moment, if I can, Ernest, to put out there that we are willing to convene to issue invitations to these folks along with some of our investors and the city players um, and invite development expertise and folks who may be looking for uh, sites, um, folks who can lend us some technical expertise. We're trying to leverage opportunity, opportunity zone status. Um, we're trying to leverage new markets tax credit designation of my project site, other project sites, including the museum. And I, I'm talking a lot because I'm excited about this session um, but but at, at the end of this call, um, I'd like to see if there are any folks via chat who would be interested in working with us on this type of convening. And, and I want to interject here also, um, 22nd Street is one corridor in the community, 16th and 9th in MLK South were also historic African American corridors. And so when you're looking at investment in the South side, please don't think that 22nd Street is the only street that's here. Tropicana is on 16th Street, which is six blocks away. So what is reflected is a group of people, um, and it's not this group is not all inclusive of what we've been doing on 22nd Street, but keep in mind that there are a significant number of projects that are um, in various stages of completion on 22nd Street. So when you're looking at um, investing in the, in, in a, when we say equitable investment, I think it's important to partner with people who are already doing this work versus saying, I have an idea and I want to build something and displacing the people who are already here. That's a real important conversation that we need to have that for the people who have historically lived in underserved communities, the worst thing that you can do is tell them you're going to redevelop their community and they can no longer live there. Uh, and this this um, conversation we'll a, about Tropicana, but that's a good example of what happened. So we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more uh, about that. But uh, right now, uh, I want to bring in Joe first from Place Project. Uh, uh, Joe, you're, you're one of the, the developers who has decided to fill in uh, one of those gaps in the in the snagatooth smile. Uh, tell us a little bit about what drew you to the 22nd Street corridor, the connectivity you hope to create between First Avenue South and Sixth Avenue South, and the changes you would like to see the city implement to help you achieve your goals. Uh, thank you, Ernest, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, could you pull up? Oh, there we go. I'm just waiting for the screen to share perfectly. So um, I'll give a little bit of history as to how I arrived at this location and, and, and sought to work on this initiative. Um, I'm based in Miami uh, and I had done a lot of work and led the development of a neighborhood down here uh, called Wynwood, which was an industrial area that um, we brought a lot of life into through arts and culture. Um, and really needed a rethinking of planning policies to allow the neighbor to continue to grow. So when I first came to St. Petersburg, I was immediately drawn to this area uh, because as I thought it was at the time, this was part of the 
the warehouse arts district and there was you know industrial buildings where there were some interesting things going on inside of them um, and the beauty of the industrial conversions is typically you have a pretty uh, vanilla non-interesting facade to a building and when you go inside you see amazing things being produced whether whether it's art um, or food and beverage or cultural uh, content and when I first came here, I started to study what had been going on in the neighborhood previously and start to really understand the history of 22nd Street. Um, and the first document that I saw um, that really started to shape my thinking was something called the Joint Action Plan, which um, was a joint document between the Warehouse Arts District Association and the Deuces to start thinking about how these neighborhoods coexist together and how they, they get better connected. And after reading that document, and spending a lot of time with people on the ground, um, both in the Warehouse Arts District and in the Deuces, um, it was very clear to me that there was a, a fundamental challenge with creating connectivity and creating activity and vibrancy within this stretch of the corridor. And the stretch that I'm speaking about is, is primarily 3rd Avenue South um, through 5th Avenue South. And the issue is that this portion of the corridor is the only portion of the corridor that has underlying industrial zoning. And if you look at the background of the image on the screen, you can see extremely large swaths of vacant land that have been vacant for, for many, many, many years um, that were old industrial uses that clearly have been sitting stagnant because of the broken zoning framework that I mentioned. So at, at, at that same time, um, I started to read about the bus rapid transit line that was going to be planned and hopefully coming soon along First Avenue South and First Avenue North. Um, and, and really realized at that point in time that it was my job to try to gain community support, um, not just from the Warehouse Arts District, but also from Deuces Live and all the surrounding property owners and other stakeholders, but to really start working with the city and, and pushing the city to start thinking about the zoning changes that would allow, um, if you go to the next slide, I think it would be helpful, that would allow the, the following goals. Um, First and foremost, I think because it's, it's the most obvious from a planning perspective is, um, as everyone here knows, the city and the county and PSTA is spending an awful lot of money to create bus rapid transit that runs east-west um, between St. Pete and St. Pete Beach. And the reason why that's relevant is in order for bus rapid transit or any mass transit to work, you need to have density and intensity around transit um, and connectivity to surrounding neighborhoods so that you can have a easily walkable connected path to get to the bus rapid transit spot. So if you think back to the image that was just on the screen and you see all the vacant parcels, my first order of business is thinking about a transit oriented development that connects Central Avenue to the Warehouse Arts District to the Deuces so that there can be job opportunities, uh, better connection and candidly just a better public realm to create more walkability and pedestrian um, connectivity between Central Avenue and South St. Pete along 22nd Street. Um, also, what's interesting about the deuces, is, as Beatrice pointed out earlier, is there, there's a different history on 22nd Street, um, south of 7th Avenue South and, and north of 7th Avenue South. Um, here, interestingly enough, th this was not an area that was filled with um, single-family homes or, or uh, African-American businesses that got raised with the hopes of, and promises from, from others in the past that were never fulfilled. So this area really sat as the, candidly, the divider between South St. Pete and Central Avenue and, and North St. Pete. Um, and my goal with the project is to really think about the cultural characteristics that exist, not just in South St. Pete, but also in the warehouse area to create something that really distinctly fits within this, within this um, neighborhood to, again, better connect the corridor between the Deuces, the Warehouse Arts Division, and Central Avenue. We need to create a bridge that brings all those neighborhoods together with connective tissue, as opposed to having big swaths of vacant land that make it very challenging to create that connectivity. Um, and then as it relates to the underlying use typology, um, there are surrounding industrial uses to the west and to the east. Um, and I think having that industrial and urban manufacturing, but modernized um, in the 2021 that we're living in to support more artisan arts and urban manufacturing uses is important. 
So as it relates to my sort of ideology on this or, or framework, it's to have th this mix of uses that includes attainable housing that, that creates that character, not just for South St. Pete, but also for the industrial buildings that are around it. And to really try to push the city, the county, forward Pinellas, to, to think about the future um, and how to create that great connectivity that, that is necessary for all of the projects on 22nd Street to thrive. Um, when you start to hear about some of the work, um, whether it's sidewalk improvements or complete street improvements and things of that nature that are happening further to the south, I sort of question, well, that's amazing and we want to see more of that. But in order to, to really bridge the gap and create the type of equality that we all want to see here, we need to think about that connectivity all the way from central down, down to South St. Pete. Um, if, we're, if we're just making these improvements and changes and thinking about that south of 7th Avenue South, that's, I, don't, I think that's not a complete narrative to really bring back the connectivity um, and equality that we all want to see along 22nd Street. I think there's a couple other slides, Ernest, I don't know if you want to click, I, probably not necessary. I think we, we talked through this. The only thing to, to point out is that the bus rapid transit um, stop is where you can't see my mouse, but there's a little dot on uh, First Avenue South and 22nd Street. Um, and the, the typical quarter mile uh, planning radius for stationary planning around mass transit um, actually takes you right to the intersection of Fifth Avenue South. So it's really thinking about this stretch of the corridor and creating you know, greater intensities and densities and allowing for mixed use and attainable housing to continue to fuel the growth um, further south uh, down 22nd Street. I think there's one more slide, but that's, uh, I think that, that shows it. That's actually a view, just, just uh, so everyone is aware, that's a view taken facing north from Fifth Avenue South. Um, another thing that I absolutely want to work on as part of the public realm work with the city um, is assuming that we get the right types of changes for the underlying land use and zoning, which of course we're working through um, with the city, through Vision 2050, through the station area planning, et cetera, is to really do something that's monumental on, on Fifth Avenue South. For those of you that know the area, Fifth Avenue South is uh, basically an incredibly high speed highway that divides, again, uh, similarly to the expressway that really divides um, 22nd Street North and South at this moment. Further, you have the Pinellas Trail that runs right through this intersection. So you, you have bicycles and pedestrians, et cetera, that have to traverse through this intersection and, and doing some form of road diet um, to create a great monument so that as people are traveling uh, south on this street, there's a moment that really designates the history and the cultural character of South St. Pete and the Deuces. I and mean, this is a huge opportunity that I, I, I hope that the, the city um, and other policymakers appreciate and understand the importance of. All right, thanks, Joe. And uh, <clears throat> now we want to turn to, to Lee Fletcher and talk a little bit about uh, the project that may be the, the best known along the corridor, and that's the Manhattan Casino uh, that has um, seen a number of uh, iterations uh, since its heyday. Lee, can you talk a little bit um, about the newest version of the Manhattan Casino and uh, your aim to not just make it a food hall, but a development engine for the corridor? Hi, yes, good morning, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting project that um, about a year and a half ago, the, the city owns the Manhattan Casino building and it has been the site of a couple of attempts that have not been fully successful um, to, to use the space as a restaurant. Um, and, and so about a year and a half ago, the current um, lessees approached us um, at Rising Tide and said, you know, we're not achieving our goal, which was to, you know, both have a successful restaurant, but also increase jobs and do those kind of things um, in the corridor. And they asked us to look at it from a perspective of entrepreneurship and what would, what, what could happen there um, if those kind of priorities were, were kind of revisited and, and kind of re, um, kind of re-looked at with fresh eyes, people who hadn't been on the corridor, because certainly I was not on the corridor then, 
And, you know, and it was an introduction for me to 22nd Street to even the first time I went to see the Manhattan. Um, we started by having conversations with people who knew a lot more about it than we did, Beatrice, Gypsy, a lot of people at the city. Um, and, and what became clear was that, that the first issue with the Manhattan was needing to reestablish it as a place of inclusivity and a place that belonged to the community in a way um, maybe differently than it had been in the past. It has a fabulous musical legacy, the history of the people who played in the space. Um, you know, it blows your mind when you, when you look at the list. There have been St. Pete Catalyst articles that listed all the different musicians and we have stuff on our social media um, if, you're, if you're a history buff to, to see all the wonderful performances that have been there. But um, it was part of the Chitlin circuit. And, um, and as such, um, with the windows open, much of the community got to enjoy some of the, the greatest African-American musicians um, that played from the you know, 40s through the 60s. So, um, so that was its history. So how to bring that back in a way that was meaningful today. Um, Rising Tide, um, we're about entrepreneurship. We're about creating opportunities for small business. Um, we believe that, that the path to generational wealth is through small business development. And so when we looked at the building, we saw an opportunity to help small businesses grow and particularly in the food industry um, because the building is um, really, you know, the way it was redeveloped by the city, it had a 2,800 square foot kitchen. It had a 5,000 square foot uh, event space upstairs, which used to be the, the actual dance hall. Um, and so looking at that space, we kind of came up with a, a redevelopment plan or a reuse plan within the building that kind of maximized the space. And, and what we tried to look at it as is every space would have at least two uses. So rather than it being a single restaurant, we came up with a food hall concept where aspiring restaurateurs can come in. We've converted the kitchen from having a single kitchen to essentially being a set of six mini kitchens within a kitchen. Um, so that aspiring restaurateurs can start their journey from their, you know, maybe moving from I had a food truck or a catering business to I want to have a restaurant. This would be a stop along the way that would allow them to refine menus, um, get their processes and procedures in place, and then um, and then launch um, both with financials and business plans and everything in form so that they could attract investors. And tying that to 22nd Street South, you know, being an engine of development of businesses on 22nd Street South. Um, we also wanted on an immediate scale, you know, offer opportunities for, for food industry pre professionals who need a commissary or a commercial kitchen for their existing businesses. So trying to work that into the operations of the kitchen. Um, the Deuces Cafe, um, in our conversations with the community, a coffee a good coffee location with, where people could have informal meetings was something that came up repeatedly in the conversation as something that was wanted. Um, so the Deuces Cafe, we've reconfigured the inside so that there, are, there is uh, what used to be the Peepo's um, takeout area is now more of a coffee shop that ties into the Kalaloo Bar. So during the day, um, it's a coffee shop and in going into the evening, it, it turns into a bar. The upstairs, the Jordan Ballroom, can, will continue to be an event space, both for private celebrations as well as musical events. Um, we also looked at the building that the city had built next to the historic structure, which had the elevators and the ADA bathrooms and those kind of things in it. Um, and it was previously not really being activated. So we, we looked at that as an opportunity to create a small scale entrepreneurial center um, where entrepreneurs on 22nd Street um, have a place to have meetings, to do their work, to get their mail, you know, so on 22nd Street without having to go downtown. At the same time, though, we are by intention designing it because we believe that one of the things that entrepreneurs, small business entrepreneurs particularly need is to develop networks of businesses. Um, we're connecting it to our membership downtown, which obviously our fit space downtown is much physically much larger. Um, so we have more members or we anticipate we'll have more members down there than we do at Rising Tide, but we want there to be um, kind of cross collaboration between the two, um, the two memberships so that you, if you're a member at one, you can use the facilities at 22 South or downtown. 
Um, we also partnered with Nikki Patton, who started the South St. Pete Marketplace, which is a Tuesday night market um, in the parking lot of um, the historic Manhattan Casino. Has two purposes. One is to bring accessible um, fresh food into the neighborhood, kind of in a, in a central location. Um, and she is working with a local farmer who actually is using urban agriculture and growing the vegetables in the neighborhood, which is exciting. And then also other small business entrepreneurs who want an opportunity to have an, another vending opportunity um, on Tuesday nights. And then finally, the most exciting part is the recognizing that not all food entrepreneurs are kind of ready to jump into a food hall or a kind of mini restaurant. Um, we're kind of pairing the for-profit operations with a nonprofit operation that we're calling Food Lab, which is, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Food Lab is um, kind of offering a couple pathways to entrepreneurial success for um, potential business owners. Um, what we found in our research and work with um, food industry entrepreneurs is that there, there are kind of two paths. If you're a food products person, meaning you make a sauce or you make a jam or you make cakes, um, you'll, you might start in your home kitchen under a cottage exemption um, and then go to a commercial kitchen or a commissary kitchen, which will get you into speci specialty retail. And then unless you have um, some support or some background in the food industry, it may go, be harder to take that next step to go into mass production because that usually requires a co-packing facility and, and some investment um, to develop quantities of projects. So product. So for those people and for people who want to have restaurants but maybe have not yet had a successful catering business or a food truck business, um, we created the food lab so that um, they can use the food lab to create the business plan, test their products using the kitchen, uh, intern in the food hall, in front of house, back of house, in the event space, whatever's appropriate for their business plan, and then launch those businesses from the food lab, which might mean coming into the food hall at some point, or it might mean not coming into the food hall and launching a food truck or doing something else. So the idea is that the, the Manhattan Casino a becomes a place of wonderful food where you can, you know, experience some of the newest and best restaurateurs in St. Petersburg, but it also um, becomes an engine to kind of repopulate the storefronts of the 22nd Street corridor because, you know, buildings and connectivity, I mean, I think in the real, you know, I'm a real estate lawyer originally by training, and I think we talk a lot about placemaking and we talk about physical structures, but people are what make the neighborhood. And, and so creating opportunities for people to create businesses in the neighborhood, in their own neighborhood, um, to, to support their families is kind of the purpose and point of what we're trying to do, as, as well as serving amazing food. And, you know, and so, you know, I'm, I'm super excited. We're a month away, I think, from opening. And our, our first set of restaurateurs, I mean, aside from the fact that I've like gained 40 pounds, I think, testing food in the last few months, um, um, it's very, very exciting, and the food, I think, is going to be amazing. We have a range of food from soul food to Jamaican food to sushi to, I mean, it's, it's really, and we, and we have a continuing ongoing process um, at our website. If you're interested or you know a food entrepreneur who's interested, um, we're going to continue to take applications because our goal is actually that our food entrepreneurs will graduate and will leave and will open their own businesses, in which case we'll need new food entrepreneurs to kind of go through the process. So, so that, that's, that's what we're doing. And, um, and it's exciting and scary and all of those kind of things all at once. Well, Lee, that certainly sounds terrific. And, and I know uh, both you and Joe have, have worked hard to uh, understand uh, uh, what the community needs and hopes to get from uh, these new developments. Uh, I'm going to go a little off script, but but Beatrice and, and, and Gypsy, I think you can weigh in on this too. Um, what are the steps that developers need to take to gain the trust and confidence um, of the African-American community, uh, particularly when, you know, we have seen a history of projects that haven't worked out uh, Joe and Lee have, have taken some of those steps, but for others uh, who have joined us this morning, describe the kind of steps developers need to take 
uh, if they're interested in coming to the corridor and gaining the trust and confidence of the community. Did you wanna go first, Beatrice? Yes, okay. okay, thank you. So when you talk about the corridor, um, I wanna be real clear that there are more corridors and more areas in the city where African-American communities are looking for investment. I'm not gonna say that 22nd Street is all built up. It's pretty close. And I don't wanna discount the work that people are doing elsewhere on the corridor. And our corridor and the two corridors that I mentioned, 16th Street and MLK South. But what I will tell you, um, if you are honestly trying to reach out to the people in the community, the people that you reach out to are the people who live there. I mean, there, there's been this, I think a long-term sort of strategy of, well, we'll just go to the largest church, even if it's five miles away from the, from the neighborhood. That, there is no one person that speaks for the community. That's the second thing that I will tell you. If you talk to business owners, they may have different responses to you than if you talk to someone who's in social services. And what's, dis, what's, what's disheartening often, often is that when people say, who do I talk to in the black community? They never say that when they talk about predominantly white community. So they never say, well, who do I need to talk to in this community to get what's done, to, to do a, a development? So we look at uh, what Joe did. Joe reached out to the contingent business organizations that were there. He reached out to the neighborhood associations who were there. And then he went outward. So I thought that that was a good indication of how to talk to the community because the community is really physically where you are. And so finding your, your friend that happens to be black that lives in your neighborhood in the suburban area is not talking to the community. So I would just ask people to really reflect upon what they mean when they say the community, because it's not just another black person. Um, and I will tell you that people in the community have always felt this way. There's just never been an opportunity for people to hear them. So I'll defer to you, Gypsy. You gotta take yourself off of me. <laughs> and I'm sorry, everybody, we're in the middle of some advocacy. Uh, one of our items is before St. Pete City Council uh, and the advocates are texting and calling to figure out how to get into the meeting. I apologize. Um, but uh, but I'm, we are so on the same page about this. Um, the way that I've said this to some folks is please don't go to um, just generic black people because they're black um, to uh, gain community support, to gain community um, feedback on the design of your project, et cetera. And I think we should also acknowledge that there is uh, increasing capacity among mainstream developers in terms of understanding what, what equity and equitable development mean, um, building bridges and relationships, uh, partnering with CDCs, for example, um, integrating um, African-Americans and other uh, underutilized groups into their project structures, was very happy to see in, in the city of Tampa in their Rome Yard uh, solicitation that they prioritized and I believe gave bonus points for representation of, of actual minority ownership, uh, equity ownership in uh, the project. So, so the good news is that there's increasing awareness, there's increasing utilization of successful uh, engagement strategies. Um, we still do see what Beatrice just mentioned, and I will give you a prime and current example. Um, on the Tropicana Field RFP, uh, one of the respondents sought to convene a group um, of folks. I previewed the list, I was on that list. Um, I previewed the list of folks, and I said, what, why these folks? Um, there were, to Beatrice's points, uh, several pastors who are heavily engaged in community advancement issues, uh, youth issues, um, you know, other issues that they're involved in, but they have no connection to redevelopment and economic development. 
no practice or capacity in those areas. And, and so I think the way I try to simplify this is to say, go to your logical stakeholders. Your logical stakeholders are going to be, for example, your neighborhood associations uh, in your project area, your redevelopment, mainstream, main street organizations in those areas, uh, black economic development corporations, and those who are involved. We happen to have a black led CDFI uh, operating in uh, St. Pete. Um, you know, so, so like just think through um, that process as opposed to creating um, black advisory councils of people who don't have a defined um, specific reason for being around your table other than the fact that they happen to be African-American. Okay, I want to encourage everyone as um, uh, we, we are, we still have a few more minutes before we wrap this up, but uh, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A uh, uh, on the call. Um, I, I have a question here that, that's already been placed. Yes, can I answer that? May I answer it from Leroy Moore? Uh, oh, I... Because it said I want to answer it live. May I answer that? Okay, go ahead. Um, it's, its question is, what has been what has been the impact of the TROP side historically on the survival of the Deuces Corridor and what opportunities exist in the TROP redevelopment to, to connect these two efforts to create more sustaining prosperity along the 22nd Street South Corridor? Thank you very much for that question. What I want to tell you is the Deuces Live is a, is a thriving small community. And so I sort of dissuade people from conflating what's going on on Tropicana to what's going on on 22nd Street. You've heard of the three projects that are going on now. And the fact that you may not have heard of them doesn't mean that they're not happening. The Warehouse Arts District um, has an arts exchange um, complex campus that's, that's right on the corner of 5th and 22nd Street. The city of St. Petersburg is getting all these accolades of being a city of the arts. That is one prime example of what's going on in the city. So yay, Tropicana, you may or may not redevelop, but that's not going to really impact what's happening on 22nd Street because all these, all these there's a lot of development on 22nd Street and maybe you all at ULI don't hear about it because it's not big developers. It's the million dollar project, the $500,000 project, the um, bootstraps, project, which is now has big investment, a la the um, arts exchange. We have Joe First and his project. We have Lee, who read, who's moving here, um, Sankofa, the Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the college is here. The fact that you don't know that all this stuff is going on doesn't mean that it's not happening. So while you may read about Tropicana um, next year, start looking for all the articles about what's going on on the Deuces Live. The Deuces Live won a National Endowment of the Arts grant and our project is Art Explosion on the Deuces that will probably happen to February 22nd, 2022. So then you'll hear about all the things that are going on, but I don't want people to think that just because we don't have 85 acres of development, that there's not things happening here. And to your question, when you're looking at equitable investment, I think sometimes you have to tell yourself just because the investment isn't one large person doesn't mean that the quarter isn't re redevelopment. We have a, um, a, a couple of people who have, who have spent a lot of money, probably more than a million in investment. And someone on this call would say it's a small investment. So. Thank you very much, Ernest, for letting me pontificate on that answer to that question, but I thought it was important to let people know that we here on 22nd are excited about Tropicana, but that's not going to drive our development. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Beatrice, for that. And, um, you know, I also wanted to ask, um, uh, and, and Joe, maybe you can um, address this question. Well, you know, whenever we talk about redevelopment of, of areas like this uh, corridor and the other corridors that Beatrice has mentioned, uh, there's always concern uh, up about uh, gentrification. 
uh, as someone who has had some successful developments, uh, how do you go about addressing those concerns, Joe? Yeah, um, that question obviously comes up often. I mean, I think the, the first piece is thinking about what gentrification means and the history of sites, uh, the history of uses. So um, in speaking with many historians in South St. Pete, again, the, the sites that, that I'm particularly focused on, the seven and a half acres that, that I own uh, north of Fifth Avenue South, um, you know, those sites were never used for housing. Um, and those sites were, were, you know, old, basically industrial sites. Um, they're currently vacant um, of all of the seven and a half acres. We, we had one, one building, which we've retrofitted into um, artist studios as an interim use, but you know, there's no displacement um, in any way, shape or form or washing away of old uses there um, that would have historical relevance or context for, for South St. Peter for 22nd Street. So I, I think on its face, it's, it, it's not gentrification um, by definition. Um, in terms of ensuring that there, the spillover effects um, are not are positive and not negative, um, I think it's a very interesting situation um, in just in terms of the, the land development code um, and the way that the surrounding areas work. So if you think about 22nd Street, um, when you go to the west, so on 23rd Street West, you're in the Palmetto Park neighborhood. Um, so there's a, an interesting transition that happens immediately from what was industrial um, abutting a single family home neighborhood, which is, is uh, peculiar um, on its face. So as it relates to, to the West, you're not going to see a greater expansion of more intensive um, or uh, denser development further to the West because there's a single family home community that, that exists there currently. Um, and as you go further to the South, um, again, the zoning framework, once you get outside of the, the quarter mile radius around the station area, um, the development framework um, has been existing and will continue to exist, um, likely, I don't want to say in perpetuity, but until a time when it makes sense to change. So the interesting thing about the site that, that we're focused on in the area, again, between 1st Avenue South and 5th Avenue South, is that it, it is, in a way, um, it, it, the spillover effects are, are contained within that quarter mile radius. Um, and so if there were to be future development and displacement, um, the only things that could be displaced would be um, older industrial buildings uh, that have industrial uses in them, or um, we we'll call them more modern industrial uses, but it is absolutely not in any way, shape or form, um, the displacement of residents um, or individuals. And again, the, 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 the sites that we control are, are vacant parcels. So um, hopefully that, that explains my view on gentrification at this location. Okay. Uh, another question uh, from our Q&A section in, in, uh, in the last few minutes we have, you still have time to get a question in there. Uh, this question is, is, are there any planned transit uh, connectors to link the various uh, efforts? Um, who, who would like to address, Beatrice, you'd like to address that question? I will tell you, uh, six years ago, the city of Pinellas County tried to do some more connection with um, Bay uh, Greenlight Pinellas, and we would have had a bus on 22nd Street. Uh, Greenlight Pinellas didn't pass. So I'll defer to Joe on what's going on on bus rapid transit because he has a lot of information on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that quickly. <clears throat> the bus rapid transit is great, and it's an amazing opportunity um, for St. Pete, uh, obviously, to get ridership going east to west, which um, has not existed in the past. But in my opinion, that is just the first step of several other steps that need to happen to create north-south connectivity. Um, the whole intent of creating mass transit is to get ridership from all different angles and all different places with people from all different walks of life. Um, and until you create better public realm to allow for pedestrian connectivity, and then of course, outside of the pedestrian walkability factor to be able to have trolleys or other transit that runs north south on the, the main corridors that have bus rapid transit stops that should absolutely be the next mission and goal um, of the city of st pete forward pinellas and the transit authorities to ensure that all of the investment in the bus rapid transit line that's taking place is actually being used in the most efficient um, and effective way and, and the only way to do that is to again create various nodes and various 
um, sort of webs of, of public transportation to feed those transit stops. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Gypsy, do you have a minute to talk about the work that is being discussed um, at the city right now in terms of community benefit agreements? Uh, and is that uh, uh, one of the solutions that can uh, help us avoid uh, some of these old school failures is having a community benefit agreement in place? Um, I think definitely yes. Um, the, they have been around long enough now uh, to have matured. So CBAs became a thing at, in the 1990s. Um, they've been, uh, it stands for Community Benefits Agreement and it essentially means that um, developers uh, are to support certain benefits. And in our case, we're asking that developers who are supported with taxpayer support. So if your project um, is, uh, has free land or low cost land or incentives or tax abatements, et cetera, um, that we want to leverage that public support and ask you to give back to the community in certain ways. We want you to support targeted workforce um, strategies uh, to bring apprentices in, to bring underrepresented groups, uh, disadvantaged groups um, into your uh, construction workforce. And we want you to focus on SBE and MBE targeting that does a better job of capturing that economic impact locally. Sustainability is another major focus, earnest of that uh, policy in St. Pete, asking developers to step up and in, uh, invest in uh, sustainability initiatives under the city plan. And I think that is a way uh, that the, it, like many other initiatives, your audience will have heard of things like supplier diversity programs, MBE targeting uh, programs, et cetera. It is a way of creating structured opportunity pathways for more um, African-American, Latino women, uh, veteran owned businesses and, and special groups to become part of the talent um, that gets development projects done. And then that does a better job of reaching out to uh, black and brown entrepreneurs to be part of the retail footprint, for example, if it were a commercial property, et cetera. So we're excited about it. The council has asked some really tough and great questions about it. Um, our developer community has asked some, some tough questions. Uh, in the words of one of our mainstream echo dev leaders, uh, they're nervous about it. And what we're doing is support asking people to support a conversation series and we'll definitely get those dates to uh, ULI to have folks come together for structured and, and facilitated review of each component of the policy. Okay, um, so in the last few minutes, I, I wanted to put this question out and I think Lee will start with you and then if um, uh, our other panelists wanna weigh in, that would be great. Uh, but Lee, let me ask, uh, if I'm a developer, if I'm on this call and, and I like what I'm hearing about uh, the promise and potential of this area and, and I ask you for advice uh, about coming into this area and trying to find a project and trying to develop it, what advice would you offer? Uh, what, what are the challenges that developers might have to overcome to, to succeed and, and enjoy the success that you are um, on the verge of having at the casino? Well, I, I think that Beatrice and Gypsy have, have basically, you know, put out there the most critical piece. And Joe also is, is simply having thoughtful and authentic conversations with people who are already invested in the area where you're thinking about becoming a developer because you, you can't, it, it, it's about weaving things together. It's not about trying to drop something arbitrarily into a neighborhood that either displaces people or doesn't fit with the culture or the um, fabric of what's going on. I think, I think when developers look at a neighborhood and say, oh, I think this would be much better if it looks more like something else I'm familiar with. That may or may not be true, but 
but the only way to ground truth that is to really talk with the people who live there and who work there and who already feel it, what's going on. Uh -oh. Joe, what, what, what do you think? Do you, do you think developers um, uh, need to have uh, a certain moxie to, to take on a project in this area? I just think they have to have the, the, the time and, and interest to engage with the local community to understand what people want and understand the history of things that went wrong and things that went right. Um, my view on, on development, and, and I do large scale um, neighborhood redevelopment projects throughout the state, is that there's not a one size fits all solution. And if you come into an area with a preconceived notion of what it's supposed to be, then your, your notion of what that is, is, is going to be flat wrong because you can't form those ideas until you understand from the people around you what they want to see and, and, and their life experience that shaped their view as to where they want it to go. Um, so for anybody that's looking to develop on 22nd Street, on 16th Street, wh wherever, it doesn't matter. The, the first step that needs to happen is, to, um, is you know, to bring your subject matter expertise and obviously bring the skills that you have, but to first and foremost listen and understand what the people that were there before you had done and, and where their true intent is to go into the future. Beatrice, what, what, what might you add to, to what we've already heard? I would ask that um, when you're thinking of um, going to a place to develop, to make sure that you see what's already there. Again, to echo, I'll, I'll say it again, there are a lot of things that are happening on 22nd Street. The fact that people don't know about them doesn't mean that they're not happening. And oftentimes, and I think this audience in particular looks at things from a very, very high level view. And I would just ask that you don't discount the projects that are small just because they're small. So, and, and think about, is it really necessary for me to displace people because I wanna build something that I think is better? Because all of us have to live in this community and I don't think it benefits anyone to continue to displace people just because we think we, we, think we want to build something that's better. So highest and best use isn't always the key indicator of development. And that's really what equitable development is about. Highest and best use may not, you may, we have a community garden on the corridor. And some people may say, well, that would be better as a three-story townhome. Well, better for whom? So I just ask that we start asking those questions that when we're talking about equitable development, what that may, and understand what that may mean is that you don't get to do what you thought that you wanted to do. So just, and, and just again, you know, like our, like um, One Community's um, Facebook page and their website, the African American Heritage Association website, um, the Warehouse Arts District website, there are a lot of things going on in our corridor or any corridor that you want to go to. Just make sure that you know what's already going on and try and weave into the fabric that's already there. I, I like how you said that. Gypsy, you, you, uh, do you have anything to add to what we've heard? Yeah, I, I, I'm in the rare happy to be here mode. I'm never just happy to be in a space and and want to just express gratitude to ULI for featuring this. Um, we've seen a lot in the post-protest movement of 2020, um, a lot of organizations um, developing their, their, their DEI focus, looking at what they uh, perhaps are seeing for the first time, beginning to build bridges of relationship. And I think this series that you all have conducted is a fantastic way to do that. And thank you for welcoming us into this uh, conversation. As specifically, I think Lee is the one who nominated me to this panel. And, and I'm serious in the request that if folks can help us with some of the more sophisticated aspects of uh, this bigger picture strategy that we're attempting, we are looking for talent to support us in uh, leveraging opportunities, the Opportunity Zone uh, location of Tangerine Plaza. And we're also looking for uh, someone to uh, work with us on a sophisticated new markets tax credit uh, structure for the Sankofa project. And, and just in general, welcoming um, expertise 
in bringing this bigger picture strategy together. And so thank you very much uh, for having me here. Okay. Um, well, I think that's, that's gonna um, wrap things up for us. It's been a great discussion, a great morning. We wanna uh, thank all of our panelists uh, again, uh, Gypsy Gallardo, Joe First, Beatrice Farrell, and Lee Fletcher. I think it's important to, to keep an eye on what's happening um, along this corridor and in the broader district. And um, certainly want to invite uh, those who are interested in uh, equitable development uh, to not shy away from uh, these efforts to, to embrace them and, and find a way that, that you can help. Uh, we always like to say when we talk about diversity and equity and inclusion, it needs to be intentional. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't always happen or organically or through osmosis. And we have the people on the panel today that can, that can lend advice, that can help guide you. And uh, certainly we like to see that. So uh, thanks again to all the panelists. Thanks for everyone for being on the call today. I think we had uh, more than 100, per, 100 people. That's a terrific turnout. And uh, I wanna thank ULI for giving me the opportunity to help guide this discussion. Thank you very much and have a good morning. Thank you. Thank you.